another series of plates for adolescents that were based on the series classics. Eugene Ionesco, one of the series of classics, had the had the had the courage to to in much ways like to set it alive in case he and, and their prophetic sensibility sometimes. He had the the ability to mock Hitler in the midst of his cancer. And by the way, this is the day, 1933, March 23rd, that Hitler was appointed as the Reich's Chancellor. He was not elected, he was appointed. And he took over from there. <laughs> But what Ionesco does is he, he, he wrote a play called The Leader, and he has different characters marching around like this, oh, just mocking Hitler. And uh, he didn't do that in Central Europe. So I wrote a play called, instead of The Leader, called The Celebrity, about some adolescents waiting for the celebrity. <laughs> and, uh, and frankly, uh, most of you don't realize how much the cult of celebrity affects who you view yourself to be. And uh, that's not the topic, that's another, another focus. But uh, be alert when you are looking at an advertisement and there's a, there's a face and a figure staring at you and somehow preconsciously you're saying to yourself, I don't look like her or him. And there are more and more people who get um, unsettled preconsciously by that interface with uh, the, 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 the fashion pose uh, that's not necessarily pornographic at all. It's just, don't I look great in this dress? Don't you want this? And what happens to us is we have a tendency to get a little bit disoriented, uh, a little bit off kilter. But what we've also found is that he makes us better buyers, better purchasers. Be alert when that is happening to you. When you're comparing your facial features and your bodily contours to those, in quotes, gag me with a spoon, models, <laughs> female and male. And it's going to get worse. Why? Because it works. <laughs> okay? Uh, but the celebrity, the, these, these teenagers are waiting for the celebrity. <laughs> and when the celebrity arrives, much like Ionesco's the leader play, the leader, the Fuhrer, he comes and he has no head. And so I have the celebrity coming and waiting, waving to his fans, and he has no head. There's a pause, maybe five second pause. And the teenagers say to each other, but the celebrity had no head. I noticed that too. The last line of the play, it's the last line of Ionesco's play usually. Still, two, <laughs> I should say. I wish I didn't have head. That's how it works. That's how it works. And by, by the way, a lot of adolescent depression, a lot of adolescent depression, is the assault of the cult of celebrity. Is the assault of the cult of celebrity. By the way, don't get overly intoxicated by the conversations you hear late night television as great as all of those hosts are. And by comparison, Bruce, with, with when I was their age. I like a long John time Carson. ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> but the, 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 the late night talk show hosts are profoundly better than I do. They almost have a prophetic like sensibility. But don't compare their conversations with the conversations you have in your dorm room. Be who you are, where you are now, where, not compared to some celebrity place that's always warmer than here, it's always cooler than where you are. Okay. The hand of the Lord and the hand of chance. You know, the whole focus is the crossroads. Uh, I want to remind you that your life 
will be full of crossroads. <laughs> it will be full of decisions that you have to make. And sometimes they're difficult decisions simply because they're difficult decisions. There are, each option has positive possibilities. But I gotta make a decision. Oh Lord, please come to me angelically. Deliver me. Whisper in my ear. This is where a lot of the, the God told me kind of stuff comes from, which is pre-consciously, sometimes consciously manipulative. If you're going to agree with God, you better agree with me. It's a pastor's disease, by the way. I was a pastor. <laughs> but be alert when somebody's manipulating you with a religious language. Okay. When you make a tough decision, don't think that just because after the decision is made, whether it's graduate school, whether it's where you're going to live, whether it's what community you're going to live with, what church you're going to go to, just because you have problems a month after you made the decision doesn't mean, mean you made the wrong decision. <laughs> I mean, what would Israel have done if they had said, okay, okay, we'll, make, we'll follow Moses, okay. And then based upon the problems that they had after they made that decision, or we made the wrong one, wrong, wrong. Life is full of complexities and crossroads and difficulties. And you are in the second act of the narrative called your life. You're following a cloud by day and a fire by night. And sometimes you're having to take one step at a time because you're not sure you can make more than that. Because you can't see beyond that. That's called life. Let me start this way, and I want to make sure I jump into this before, uh, uh, before too long. But to help you understand the importance of knowing your story from a biblical perspective, your story and the complexities that are before it and not yet happened, the sorrows that have not yet experienced, the joys that have not been experienced, the complexities. Remember, in, in the oldest uh, resume probably of human history, the Apostle Paul's where he says one of his characteristics is that he's full of sorrow yet full of joy. Read that in 2 Corinthians. The, the reality is, is that both are true. Paradox is truths that seem to be opposite equally true, as is the case in your life, in almost every role. Oftentimes when I talk to athletes, I'm struggling. That means oftentimes, sometimes, <laughs> they stop working harder than any than they had them because they're struggling. Or because they've lost a few. What? No, you come into your season saying, no one is working harder than me. No one. And I'm going to learn how to respond even wisely to defeats, which means, what can I do better? How can I encourage my teammates even more? Now, first thing I'm going to have you uh, uh, write down, if you will, and I, I don't, you, there's no test. Life, your life is the test, all right? I used to tell, Bruce, I used to tell my students, you know, uh, the Cobb Theory students especially, uh, Friday's the test, it's a sterile environment, it's this, this classroom, and these are the, the questions, but the real test is going to be 20 years from now, whether or not you can retrieve these theoretical structures to help you understand or help your child understand this sorrow and this corner turning event. But here it is. From a biblical perspective, every role you play has three acts, a beginning, a middle, and an end. A beginning, a middle, and an end. Narrative brilliance will always involve a beginning, a middle, and an end. A first act, second act, and a third act. 
Every day you live, every role you play has three acts, a beginning, a middle, and an end. From a biblical perspective, St. Paul, whether you agree with him or not, is one of the most influential people in, in world history. He said this to the Corinthians. And by the way, um, uh, uh, about a gener uh, uh, two-thirds of a generation after Jesus was, was crucified. 55 BC, he wrote to the Corinthians. Both letters. Uh, he says this, uh, people of God in Corinth, uh, you need to understand that you are God's field. Another way of putting that, another way of translating, you are God's plan. Some of you remember this from, I give this lecture all the time because it's so central of helping you un understand who you are, where you are, why you are. Did you hear that? Who you are, where you are, why you are. He said, you are God's plan. You are God's field. And then he says, you are God's building. And one of the major influences of my life, the great uh, Christian rabbi, if you will, whose ministry to rabbis uh, was profoundly influential, Haskell Stone. He said, this is one of the great illustrations to help us understand what God is at God, what is it like to have God at work in our life. You are God's plant. Act one in the life of a plant is what? Anyone, for $50 and a chance to appear next week's show. <laughs> Anyone, what's act one in the, in, the, in, in, in the image of you are God's plant? Yeah, a seed. A seed, it involves a seed, but the Apostle Paul uses that analogy, and it's not quite the answer, but you get $45, and you know, it, it, it must, uh, that, the application must come with a picture of you with your arms around Sally Field, okay? Uh, uh, but, um, Paul says, somebody planted the seed, somebody else watered it, but only God does what? It causes it to sprout. Yeah, causes it to sprout. Germinates the seed. That's the beginning of your, the journey called your life. Okay, the germination of the seed. What's act two in that image of the plant? Anyone want to guess? The life and growth of the plant. For it to grow, it has to require sunshine and storms. Right? Tension in the ground. Both. It can't just do with one. It needs a variety of of elements. That's act two. And that's the story called your Christian life. And it's really the story of everyone's life. It's three acts. A beginning, a middle, and an end. What do you think act three is in that image? If act one is the germination of the seed, act two is the growth of the plant, what's act three? Spreading more seed. What's that? Spreading more seed. Good try, good try, good try. Uh, yeah, well, uh, good try, good try, good, good images, good try. but it's the it's called the harvest, the harvest. By the way, this is a dominant image that Jesus uses from which he tells so many of his parables. And I'd like to ask college students who, who uh, are associated with a Christian institution and maybe Christians themselves, how many of the parables of Jesus do you know that you could share with children? that you could share with yourself to help you understand what life is like. For instance, there are seven parables in Matthew 13, all of which help us understand what life is like, because it's describing what the kingdom of God is like. And I ask most students, can you name one? They can't! Why? Because you live in a culture that tells you you don't have to memorize anything, because you can look it up. And it's always seven seconds too late. Can you imagine Jesus? This is taken from Adam Davidson, the brilliant Free Methodist minister in Kalamazoo, student and graduate of Spring Arbor. Can you imagine Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew 4 and Luke 4 when he's tempted by Satan? Uh, what is that verse? Oh! Jesus was too poor to own a Bible. But as a, 
a, a non-traditionally trained rabbi, shall we say, when they started memorizing the Pentateuch at six years old, he had it here. So what's he say? He quotes to Satan, Deuteronomy 8.3, uh, man does not live, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds off the word of God. He knew it. He could share it on command. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. He could retrieve De uh, Deuteronomy 6.13 on command. We can't do that anymore because that's not our focus because we can look it up. What's worth memorizing? What's worth memorizing? What are you saying is worth retrieving and practice retrieving every day to build your mind? So that, that, that's the first, and i got to go quick here. The second dominant metaphor from the Bible, and there are three of them, that help us understand what it is to have God at work in our life, who we are, where we are, why we are, is you are God's building. And again, three phases. You can chart it out. You are God's plant, the germination of the seed plant, uh, uh, Act 1. You are the, the, the development of the plant, Act 2. The harvest, Act 3. Jesus, a lot of his parables, is saying, look, you better be prepared for the harvest. He's speaking metaphorically. You are God's building. What's act one in that? Foundation. Foundation, good. But it's more specifically, Paul has something more, more specifically tied to the Old Testament. It's the chief cornerstone, the cornerstone that's laid. With the foundation, the cornerstone is laid. That's the beginning of the role. What's Act Two in the building of the building called your life? In the building called your ministry? In the building called your athletic development or your artistic involvement or your scientific career? What's Act Two? Is it first the cornerstone then the building of the walls? The building of the building, yeah, the building of the walls. And the Apostle Paul says you can use any materials you want to build the building called your life. Any materials you want. You can use wood, hay, and stubble to build a building called your life. It works. You know, selling drugs gets you money. <laughs> Being addicted to gambling on, on, on the internet gets you money. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Or you can use gold, silver, and precious metals. It's up to you. And by the way, uh, implications of the gold, silver, and precious metals are related to the fruit of the Spirit, which are the nine, the nine virtues that are eternally virtuous and eternally valuable. You want to be excited about your future? And that's a society doesn't really know how very uh, effectively to tell you how to get excited about being 50 years older than you are now. You know why? Because they don't tell you this. If you're serious about the things of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit, 50 years, those fruit from now are 50 years bigger and wiser and more robust. In other words, you're 50 years wiser. You're 50 years more capable of patience. You're 50 years more capable of loving sacrifice than you are now. Wow, wow, you can get there. Wow. So, Act 2 is the building of the building. What is Act 3 in that metaphor? In fact, there used to be a great band that sold a lot of records called After the Fire, a British band. Man, they sold a lot. In fact, there's probably one song, Don't Turn Around, that was theirs, that sold millions of copies. You probably heard it. After the Fire took it from this metaphor. It's the third act of the building metaphor. Laying of the cornerstone, building of the building, you can use whatever uh, materials you want. And then finally is the fire. The fire. And oh, by the way, when the Bible talks about fire, it's not always talking literally about fire. Remember the story of, 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 the, uh, of the rich man in Gehenna? Oh, please, Abraham, send Lazarus to dip the tongue, to, 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 to dip his finger in water and come and quench my thirst. 
His, we think from a medieval perspective that that man, his forearms were on fire. His forehead was on fire. And he wants a drink? Come on. But, let's move on to the third and then we're going to jump into this. The third is this. If the first is you are God's field. He's invested in you. He's planted in you. He wants you to cultivate. In fact, that's your objective every day. I want to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit in my life. I want to become more loving sacrificially today than I was yesterday. That's my job. Overarching. You are God's building. <clears throat> but also, you are God's Israel. Do you remember from uh, X, uh, Genesis 32? It was uh, Jacob who, who <laughs> not the nicest guy in the world. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be his brother. <laughs> I can so relate to Esau. That guy so POs me. I can relate. By the way, I can also relate to Saul. I didn't want this job. <laughs> he was, Saul was hiding when he was coronated. You gotta like that guy. But remember Israel, Jacob, when he wrestled with God. And by the way, you were born to wrestle with God, said Charles Williams. What does that mean? Sometimes it's okay for you to be angry. My brother's sick. Why isn't he getting better? Why? That's a prayer. You ever think of that? Look it up in Psalm 64. It's a prayer. Hear me, O God, as I voice my complaint. You don't always have to wash your hands and have, you know, a, 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 a holiday spirit. Oh, no, Lord, thank you. You, have to be, you don't have to be sanguine to follow Jesus. In fact, most of the prophets were not. <laughs> Next time you find yourself angry with God, angry with circumstance, make turn it into a prayer. It's okay if you pop on the table. It's okay if you scream. Okay, oh, oh, God isn't going to go, oh, you're upset. I mean, you're upset with me, so that's what you get. Three days of the flu. This is superstition. You know, sometimes we, we, we want to follow God, you know, we better go to church or else, you know, something bad's going to happen. That's superstition. So, the last metaphor is you are God's Israel. What's, what's Act 1? The Exodus, which happened about 1400 B.C. And yes, it's good to, to have um, historic marking places so that you can understand context. You are God's Israel and that act one in the story called your life, you left that service. You left you left uh, Egypt. You left the bondage. What's act two? Act two is wandering in the wilderness, a step at a time, following the cloud by day and the fire by night. Sometimes I can't walk any farther because I can't find any more faith to take a leap. I can take a leap, but leak, but not a leap. <laughs> it's going to take you time to get there. What's Act Three? Crossing the Jordan. This is why crossing the Jordan is such a great metaphor for our deaths. And if Jesus, you know. doesn't come back for a while, you're going to die. You're going to go and see, oh, he looks real peaceful. I wish he had his nostril hairs. <laughs> but crossing the Jordan, you are God's Israel. He's doing a story in you. And today's, what happened today isn't the whole, whole story. Even one chapter isn't fact that there's going to be many chapters. And through it all, you're called to be faithful and to commit yourself to cultivating the fruit of the Spirit, love, 
which is agape love. Do you have a definition for agape love? Caring about the best interest of the object of love, regardless of their response. It's essentially sacrificial love. So when Jesus said, God so loved you, the world. By the way, have working definitions of major principles, theologically, philosophically. May, memorize them, and you will use them hundreds of times for the rest of your life. For instance, what's hope from a biblical perspective? The purpose behind persistence, that's hope. That's why whenever there's a marriage that's disintegrating and wants to reconstruct, the first thing you have to re help them reconstruct is hope, the purpose of persistence. Why continue? If you're discouraged as an athlete, or as an artist, or as a scientist and researcher, why continue? You need hope. It's the purpose behind persistence. What's your hope? But it's commitment. Your commitment over time, despite the circumstances, demonstrating and cultivating the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Okay, let's go here. This is the weirdest story. I don't know how to do this. Uh, oftentimes what happens when in the complication called our life, we're trying to decide what to do, where to go, how to respond. Sometimes we have cultivated what we call um, tests used to determine the will, the mind, the desire of God, or the gods. See 1 Samuel 6 through 9. You can just take down these, some of these texts. And by the way, um, I'm going to pass around my journal, and you can want to put your name and your an email in that so I can send this to you. Uh, um, by the way, do you have a journal? Are you are, are you responding to what what you learned about today? What you found interesting today? What made you mad today? What ideas you had that you want to steward? What verses? What quotes? What statistics might be still? Uh, 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 elevating and so uh, 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 striking that you want to memorize them. Because uh, inspiration passes, said Abraham Joshua Heschel, one of my heroes. Inspiration passes. Having been inspired, never passes. In other words, if you can retrieve what inspired you on command, the circumstances invite you to redeem it, you have an oasis of the mind whenever you need it. But, well, we don't have to memorize anything because we can look it up. And then we proceed. Yeah. Some of these tests, the causes of events. You remember, uh, you know, the first, uh, um, this is in uh, Joshua chapter 7. I'm going to have to jump over some of these things. But uh, remember when uh, the Israelites conquered Jericho and we used to sing that as kids? You know, think about that. Conquer the love of Jericho. No. Uh, <laughs> We're singing, little kids are singing about the, 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 the killing, uh, the massacre of many people. I'm, what? Okay, okay, okay. Uh, we're okay. Um, but uh, as Jericho is defeated, Israel is, is elated, and then they go to, to fight the next city, which is Ai. Ai, okay? Probably screw me up on the spelling bee, but Ai. They lose to that city, which is much smaller, much scrawnier. What's going on? What's going on? Do you ever feel like that? What happened? I thought we were ready. I thought I was going to have a better experience. I was looking forward to this retreat. So they, what happened is they realized that uh, the Spirit of God has led them to, to recognize Achan as a man who had fallen to temptation. By the way, temptation is tempting. That's why it's called temptation. 
what he had done is he'd seen some paraphernalia, some gold, some garments, and he stole them. And Yahweh had said, look it, look it, you're not here to loot. So there's sin in the camp. So they find Achan. And, you know, it, it, the reaction from our contemporary perspective uh, is overreactive. They kill his whole family, including his kids. Come on, God! And it's okay, as you read the scriptures, to go, what? What? It's okay to do that. It's okay when you read your, uh, um, um, uh, James chapter 2, don't put your foot in our hope. Uh, in our Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Suppose a man, a person comes into your, into your church meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a, another man wearing shabby clothes comes in. If you should say to the one with the gold ring, oh, here's another seat for you. And then say to the poor man, stand over there. Or sit on the floor at my feet. Get out of my hair. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil motives? And then I scream sometimes when I read that and say, why, why, why wasn't the church more convinced of this so that they could walk a line in line with Martin Luther King? Right? we got to move on. <laughs> Direction, what road should I take? Oh, 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 oh. By the way, the two best books on uh, decision making and, uh, and, and, and direction regarding the will of God are decision making in the will of God, I'm forgetting the name of the author, decision making in the will of God, and Paul Little's book, uh, How to Affirm the Will of God. Great books. About a generation old. Let's continue. Assurance. Remember Gideon's fleece. I made a decision about a graduate school. I made a decision about a major. I made a decision about a, 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 a roommate. I made a decision about a possible marital partner. And by the way, ultimately you're married to God. I made a decision about a church. I need assurance because the assurance we think is going to be great decision, great decision. Nothing's going to go wrong. When you make a decision about what church you're going to, leave, uh, you're going to attend, after you make a decision about where you're going to live, after you graduate from Spring Arbor, and you say, the pastor said that? Why are these three people that are part of my singles group or my young marriage group irritating me? Maybe I made the wrong decision. Maybe it's that Baptist church or that Catholic church, whatever. Consider the following from 1 Samuel chapters 4 through 6. I'm just going to set up the story, but read it on your own. And oh, by the way, do you have a Bible reading plan? Most Christian college students do not. And the major reason why we're not reading the Bible systematically every day is because, in quotes, you're not getting anything out of it. After three days I've tried, I'm not getting anything out of it. The Jews would say to you, that's the wrong reason. You do it because it's a mitzvah. You get to know the text of Scripture because it's a good and important discipline indeed. You do it and uh, getting something out of it comes as a byproduct of that. Okay? It's like, you know, the athlete who has to, uh, you know, uh, work out every day. I'm, getting, I'm not getting anything out of this, so I'm going to quit. No, 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 you do it because it's a discipline necessary for your field. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Choose a gospel. And if you haven't chosen a gospel yet, to read and know by like the back of your hand? Choose Matthew. Why? Because what I'm saying is, related to the calendar date, read that chapter of Matthew. Today's is the 23rd. You get to read the seven woes of Jesus. 
I sometimes perform the seven modes, and I once did it in chapel several years ago. Mm -hmm. I, I, I planted one of my students in the, in, in the, in the balcony. And on the fourth wall, he, he was told to get up and start screaming at me that I was being anti-Semitic and then storm out. I don't know if you ever met Ronnie Ferguson. <clears throat> and the students were like freaked out as the people, when Jesus was confronting the Pharisees, were freaked out. But we read the Bible so passively, we don't see the drama there. So he storms out, this, this student of mine, and people who didn't know he's my student were like in shock. And then after I was finished, and I said simply this, now you know why they wanted to kill him? And the student body laughed. Now we get it. We get it. You're not going to talk to my rabbi that way. <laughs> but I, I'm going to challenge you. Read Matthew related to the calendar date, associated with the calendar date. <clears throat> And again, it's a new habit. If you forget about it for three days, don't pick up where you left off. Pick, go, just go to today's manna. Just to today's. <clears throat> Do this for four or five months until you can retrieve something from every chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. For instance, this simple. Matthew 1, chapter 1. It's the chronology. Matthew 2, the Christmas story. Matthew 3. Introduction of John the Baptist, Matthew 4, Jesus in the wilderness, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. Matthew 8, Jesus has cast out two demoniacs. By the way, uh, ask me to tell those stories on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> but start a Bible reading plan that its purpose is to remember, is to remember. I'm doing this because I want to develop the discipline, because it's a good thing to do. Not because I feel like it, not because I'm thinking I'm going to get something out of it. Now some of you say, well what about reading the Bible through in a year? Do that once in your life, once. In my view it's overrated. Why? Because it's too much in one day. It's too much in one day. It's good to do it once, or twice. Then you say, well, well I do devotionals. <clears throat> By the way, that would be like um, asking an athlete, how's your game? And they want to tell you about their, their training meal. You ask an athlete, how's your game? They're going to answer, she or he is going to answer about the arena. Not their relationship with their coach first. Not what they're eating at their training meal. All of those are necessary. We would ask you, you know, how's your relationship with God? You want to talk about your devotional life. It's more than that. <clears throat> now, I'll get through this. <laughs> Do you remember the story of Samuel, the little boy who hears the voice? Can you imagine this? You know, Samuel. And he thinks it's Eli. And he goes to Eli, and he says, "No, no. Next time, it's I think it's, it's the voice of the living God, which is again they had no idea how big the universe was then, All right? But that Creator of the universe speaking to this little boy, Samuel. And what's the message? I'm sorry to have to tell you that uh, very soon your master and his all his kids are going to die, and Israel is going to be overwhelmed by the Philistines." That's what happened. Can you imagine the little boy having to tell Eli? <clears throat> so, the battle happens. 30,000 between Philistia, Philistia and uh, uh, the Philistines and Israelites. 30,000 Israelite foot soldiers die. These are sons. These are brothers. These are dads. There's a lot of weeping in Israel. 30,000. What's the population of Jackson? And what happens is the Philistines, in their defeat of the Israelites, go into the tabernacle. What? <clears throat> go into the Holy of Holies, where the holiest, holy object in Israel, the Ark of the Covenant. And that's another talk. The power 
of Yom Kippur to help us understand relational complexities and relational sin and relational repentance. But the Philistines go into the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, and what do they take? With no, with no punishment, no response from Yahweh, they take the Ark of the Covenant as a spoil of war. Because back then, when cities, when it was before there were nations, essentially, but when city-states fought each other, it was one God fighting against another. And so here the Philistines who worshipped Dagon, the sea god, this was a demonstration of Dagon's power over Yahweh. Want to bet? So they bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Philistia, to their capital city called Ashdod. You can look it up in your Bible map. They bring it into uh, a Dagon's temple and put it, submit it to Dagon, who's up there, you know, and the Ark of the Covenant is below, submitting to Dagon. The next morning, what happens? Dagon is, boom, pushed over face down before the Ark of the Covenant, as though worshiping the Ark of Yahweh, who resided, who resided, didn't at that point, uh, above the ceremony, the angels that were uh, uh, brazen on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat. So, oh, okay, you can imagine, just, just, just imagine, you're one of the, the priests of Dagon, 1400 BC. Okay, okay, we figure out what happened. Uh, the wind blew, and blew Dagon down over. Okay, let's pick it up. Come on, guys, come on. Now. One, two, three, one. And again, think of yourself, Todd, as a, as a filmmaker. How do you film this? This is how you bring the Bible to life. Whatever the scene is, how would you film it? Put pauses in there. Give them some intensity. They put up Dagon back on his perch. Wait a day. The next morning, what happened? The same priests come in. And again, priests, what they did functionally is they justified the existence of what is. Prophets confronted what is with what should be. That's why they got killed. But by the way, uh, the priests of Dagon, there were no prophets of Dagon. That we know of. But the next day, what happens? Dagon is again thrown down, head severed, arm severed. Thrown to the threshold. Can you imagine those same priests going, uh, do a close-up of their face. Uh, this is not good. <laughs> and already when it started to happen, is plagues had started to break up in Dagon, in Dagon's capital city of Ashdod and Ephraim. <clears throat> we figured they were probably a, a rat a, outpouring and people were getting sick with tumors. Okay, what's, this is weird. And so the priest starts saying, okay, is this the hand of chance, or is this the hand of Yahweh? And they knew Yahweh's name, as did <coughs> Pharaoh. Not because he knew Yahweh and respected and revered Yahweh, but he's mocking it. But the priests of Dagon said, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get a wagon, and hitch two cows that have never been yoked, have, been, have had calves, but have never been yoked. We're going to hitch them to this wagon, put the Ark of the Covenant on the wagon, surround it with guilt offerings to, devoted to Yahweh, because we might have upset him. Gold tumors, golden rats, surrounding the Ark of the Covenant. And then they take the Ark of the Covenant to a fork in the road. And I would, can, I, I, why hasn't this ever been filmed? A fork in the road, somewhere in Saudi Arabia, somewhere, no, 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 it would be, it would be east of there. But, 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 <clears throat> the fork in the road, if it goes north, northeast, it goes to Beth Shemash, the Israeli town. If it goes north, the road north uh, northwest goes heads back to Ashdod. This is what the priests, the test they set up. If these cows, not because of prompting from us, if these cows pull this wagon with this box, this holy box of Israel, if they pull it north northeast toward Beth Shemesh, we'll know that this is 
the plagues that we're experiencing, the difficulty we're experiencing, the shock that we are experiencing of seeing our God, Dagon, head down, head severed, arm severed, we'll know that this is the work of Yahweh. But if, it, if these cows head back randomly back to Philistia, we'll know that this is the hand of chance. So can you imagine? Okay, we got to set up. We, we priests, we don't know how many there were. We know that they were probably males. What did we do to females? What did the... the uh, a lot of these Canaanite religious systems do to females? Well, they picked one each year to kill. Oh, God. But, you're pausing. Where do the cows head? Pull the wagon towards Israel. And you can imagine these men, their jaws drop, and they say something more than holy blank. <laughs> Sometimes that's a holy phrase, by the way. Whoa. Whoa. <clears throat> Let's press on. Why did Yahweh honor the test that was made by the people of Philistia? Well, the reality is partly because he loved them as much as he did Israel. In a sense, they were his earthly creation. You are, they were the image of God that were misconstrued. By the way, what does it mean when somebody says you're the image of God? And that's the, the, the basics of your human work. You are made in God's image. It means that God has appointed you to represent what he is like to the rest of his earthly creation. We love sacrificially and circumstances require it because that's what God does. We listen because God listens. We forgive because God forgives. That's what it means to faithfully bear the image of God. How should Christians gather information needed in their lives about causes of events, directions, and assurance? Some other questions. What school should I attend? These are some of the examples. Or, or, or send my child to. Should I move? Should I retire early? Should I marry? Or whom should I marry? Should I buy that country condominium? What job should I take? And then oftentimes the concerns brought to God, what, what school, Lord, whatever accepted this letter comes first. Lord, should I move? Speak through my supervisor. Should I buy that condo? If interest rates fall below a certain degree. And we, get, we have these Gideon's fleeces. We have these little tests. What job should I take? Lord, give me something to sign, a miraculous confirmation, something like a dramatic salary increase would be great. We're bargaining with God. And sometimes he says, make a decision. <laughs> when coming to the Lord with questions about his will, remember there are, quickly, questions where God has already given a definite yes or no. You don't have to pray about whether or not you should forgive you don't have to pray about whether or not you should love sacrificially. You, you don't have to pray about whether or not you should continue your bigotry. <clears throat> By the way, from a biblical perspective, what is the nature and history of racism? Wow. Specific directions regarding Christian character and interpersonal responsibilities. He's already given you his will. His will is that you grow in your capacity to forgive, that you grow in your capacity to be patient, you grow in your capacity to be joyful, despite the sorrow. <clears throat> Questions and concerns where he wants us to consult our own, what's an interesting phrase, sanctified preferences. An A.W. Tozer term was one of the major pioneers of the Christian Missionary Alliance. Knowledge of the Holy, a highly recommended book, Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer, and Sanctified Discretion by Paul Little. As we grow in Christ, he's saying, look at 
Trust your sanctified discretion. Please consider the following when you determine what road you should choose. When you're at a crossroads, when it's confusing, when it seems difficult ahead. We're almost done. To find the Lord's desire or, or will does not mean frantically looking under obscure rocks, out of the way woods or dark closets. It is to step confidently and freely into the gracious light that shines on the path before you. <clears throat> the anxiety related to finding God's will in these important matters is no different than the anxiety accompanying any big decision. Spring Arbor students. Big, tough decisions affecting the course of many lives are part of everyone's life. Our natural desire is to want to make the right one. So we get stressed about it, understandably. It's a sanctified stress. Except for the things that specifically commanded or forbidden, we are free to choose amongst the many roads before us. God is pleased when you are pleased. That's the emphasis of Psalm 34. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. He has led us into green pastures and beside still waters, but our shepherd has not told us what blade of grass to eat or what part of the pond to drink. It's your sanctified discretion. Avoid the mistake of thinking that God gives preference to the irrational and the unobvious. There's no need to ask God, the Lord, uh, the Lord for the time when there's a watch on your wrist. Should I respect my coach? Duh, get off your knees. Should I confront this injustice? Yeah. Should I repent? Yeah. In our daily lives, focus on the aspect of God's will that will, has already been revealed. Your job is to wake up every day in the morning and say, my job is this, is to cultivate my capacity to love sacrificially. That's my job. Whether I feel like it or not. You're committed to that. What does that look like 10 years from now? You are 10 years wiser. That's the best way to get excited about the future. Regarding our test fleeces for special guidance, recognize our common tendency to, to change the fleece, to change the test when we don't like the results. In other words, we already have an opinion. Make the decision based upon what you think. As a pastor, I saw this happen all the time. Fleeces changed when people didn't like the results. Mm -hmm. Avoid seeing problems that arise after a decision has been made as a sign that you made the wrong decision. Some people who decide to get married, first time that they have struggled, did I make the wrong move here? You've made a covenant. You are made, made in God's image. You are keeping, making and keeping promises. Why? Because that's what God does. Wow. Study the truths of Psalm 34, 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desire of your heart. Make sense? Any questions? By the way, uh, I think my journal is going around. Make sure you have my. Uh, put your uh, email in there and I'll send you this text. And don't hesitate to ask me anything. And in fact, until I die, I'm available for consultations. Uh, You'll know more than me. Okay? Can we have a prayer for you before you go? Oh, and by the way, if we didn't pray, uh, this wouldn't have worked as well. It's stupid. We pray because we're invited to pray. Because we can talk to the God of the universe, not because, oh, it will make it better.
one of the prophets describes this as rabbits, but the religion um, the craving is it's a good luck charm. Let's pray. Let me ask the Lord's blessing on you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face to shine upon you. Grant you great peace. And may you grow in wisdom. May you grow in strength. May you grow in the fruit of the Spirit. May you grow in confidence that many of the decisions you'll make before you will help you 